There's this guy. Let's name him Colin. I'm two days into Khaled, and I'm three left behind. Stop. Do you know that song? No, but Nick sings it a, a good bit. <clears throat> Stuck in my head now. Dude, you sound good. You said what? I said, dude, you sound good. Are you kidding? Uh, I mean, you mentioned that you had a cold earlier. You can tell? A little bit, yeah. I guess I'm just gonna get sick every month, like the dumb. I can't. Never mind. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't now. Um, you're under. You're under the corporate dollar. Yeah. How? How? How quit so quick? How? <laughs> how lose it so quick? <laughs> I'll be out of there just as fast as I got in. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, sorry. All right, let's get into it. Um, I figured that we can kind of start off with the Super Bowl stuff, and then we'll get into our f- official uh, Big Board 1.0 hosted by Noah Malone and Stephen Boris. We'll each be giving one each, obviously. So, um, obviously... I spent some time with the game. Um, I've been thinking about which side I would like to go on. And the one thing that just continued to stick out to me was the fact that the large reported sums of public money that are all on the Chiefs and Vegas and everyone else seems to be completely content and okay with keeping the line exactly where it's at there hasn't been much line movement i saw at some point it moved to like one and a half back up to two and a half so just seeing the fact that like i i saw like 83 percent of the public money is on like uh, for bet mgms on the chiefs and then like it's i've seen everything else has been like 74 plus across every other sports book i just think it's interesting that they're completely content with keeping the chiefs as underdogs so with that being said, my first official bet for the Super Bowl, place it today, a hundred dollars to win ninety five twenty four, is the Niners minus two and a half. I am equally as surprised as you are with the amount of money that's been put on the Chiefs and how there still has been almost no line movement. Like half a point isn't absurd. Um so it's really wild that it's I guess it seems like all the sharps are all on on the Niners here if the public if the public's pretty much all over the Chiefs and we're getting little to no line movement am I correct in that statement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I mentioned this last week. I bet against Mahomes so many times this year because we just didn't think the Chiefs were good and here they are. I'm gonna. I'm. I haven't bet this yet, but I will be betting on the Chiefs. Yeah, I just like. Oh, that's that's got to make you feel great. Yeah. Well, I I just it. What makes me feel great is how, <clears throat> like, how everyone was so like off the Chiefs, and how everybody's so reeled back in on them at this point, and the big key factor of the entire situation and a lot of like the explanations from the people who create content on sports betting and have big shows as like we listen to with bill simmons etc have their reasoning has been well it's i'm not betting against patrick mahomes fair point but in all of these games patrick mahomes hasn't been extremely spectacular to the point where you're looking at him being like Holy shit, Patrick Mahomes is single-handedly pulling this team to victories. What's really stuck out is their defense and how dominant their defense has been over the course of since December to this point has been probably one of the best defenses in the entire league. And if somebody wanted to... I believe they were second in DVOA. Or fifth in DVOA. Fifth in DVOA, the Niners were second in DVOA, I think. And, and it goes to show you, I think, like, 
I think everybody can pretty much sit here and agree that the the Chiefs have a better defense than the Niners. At least I think that. Um, so I just think it's extremely interesting that that is the reasoning why people are leading with taking the Chiefs rather than being like Patrick Mahomes is being a game manager, doing all the right things. They're really able to establish this this run with Isaiah Pacheco, and they have an all time great defense on the other side of the football. But with that being said, I think that the Niners have far more, far enough weapons to be able to combat the fact that they're not going to be able to shut everything down. So that's just another kind of lean of why I like the Niners in this situation. And you even brought it up today because I said that I think I do think that they're utilize the Chiefs are utilizing their weapons well. Like they're 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 using Rasheed Rice in a different way, getting him like manufactured touches and letting him create with the ball in his hands because he's a good athlete. They unlocked Travis Kelsey in this postseason, which they absolutely needed to do. But you brought up the fact even like they still don't score touchdowns even and they're not great in the red zone. So and they don't score in the in the second half too well. So with that being said, too, like that's another reason why I'm slightly sh- shying away from from the the Chiefs in this spot. So I want to touch on like the the Patrick Mahomes thing that you mentioned at the very beginning of that. Um Obviously, this version of Patrick Mahomes that we've seen so far isn't the guy where he's throwing for 450 yards every game, like four touchdowns. He is more of like the game manager. But I think ultimately what it comes down to is when the game's on the line, do you trust Patrick Mahomes to go and get it done? And I think that's that's personally where I'm at with this. Obviously, the defense has been phenomenal, and I'm not discrediting them at all. I do think that this Niners offense is going to be able to move the football on them, but I think if it comes down to it, it's a one-score game, and you've got you've got the Chiefs with the football. I, I just trust Patrick Mahomes to go down there and lead the team to, to a, a touchdown and or a field goal and win the game. I think that's really – I'm not expecting him – to go out there and have a ridiculous game stat wise. But if they're able to keep this close to a a one score game and they end up getting the ball in the fourth quarter, I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible to not pick Patrick Mahomes to, to go in there and and finish the job at that point is where I'm at. At least I I, I'm sure sure. that's probably where a lot of other people are at too with their reasoning behind the chiefs. But like by no means do I expect Patrick Mahomes to go out there and go absolutely crazy. I yeah. think it has to be they have to be it has to be a complete game on both sides of the football for them to go out there and win this game. Obviously, they're the underdog for a reason. I think obviously, and we all do that the Niners are a really good football team and they've got a lot of weapons that can put you in a lot of uncomfortable situations as a defense. Um, but the Chiefs defense is solid. Their offense has done what they've needed to do. Um, and it, and obviously this this game's a two point spread for a reason. Um I think it's going to be a close game. Neither one of these teams really gets blown out. So um, if it really comes down to it, last possession, Mahomes has the ball. It's pretty much automatic. Yeah. and, and Or it has, it has been. It has been. Well, I mean, there's been multiple times this season where that hasn't been the case with Mahomes in this offense. Where In the biggest have, moments, it has been. In the biggest moments, it has been. But over the course of the, just strictly this season, he hasn't that hasn't been the case. And then you can even sit here and pretty much say like he didn't in the biggest moments. He hasn't had to do that yet. And I know in past season, I'm not saying Mahomes is the best quarterback in the league. I'm not saying that. <clears throat> but this postseason, he hasn't had to go and make a play like that or have to go and make a drive like that to set them up in a position like that. So that's why. And. And when it did happen this season, there were a few times throughout the course of the season where it did not pan out the way that they thought it would. So like once against the Raiders, once against the Bills, once against the Broncos, where they weren't able to go down and edge the game. And that's regular season football. And they're in the Super Bowl for a reason. But that's just another tidbit that I'm throwing out there that I think is pretty interesting, where at times where it did have to happen this season, it always wasn't automatic. Yeah. And I agree with you for, for the regular season this far, but ultimately here they are. And all that matters is 
can you get it done in the playoffs, which we've seen Patrick Mahomes do constantly. So it's hard for me to pick against him in this situation. Um, with that being said, do you have a score prediction for us? <clears throat> uh, I think that the final score of this game is going to be like 31 to 17 Niners. Okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking realistically like 28. 24 chiefs is where I, is where I had it. I'm going to write my score down. So, if, so I can remember it. Right. Yeah. Down I, with it. I don't have my, what, what was it? I don't have a pen. 28, 24 chiefs. That'd be, that'd be a great game, man. I'll tell you what. All time classic. <laughs> that'd be a classic. Um, Yeah. I, I like the Niners with that being said, with that score that I even said, I placed $25 on the 49ers minus six and a half to win $49. That's my second bet that I placed today when I texted you earlier. Okay. Are, so you've only got two so far. Are there any other bets that you've been looking at that? Have I have a full intriguing? card. I have a pretty much a full card placed already. Okay. Do you want to run me through what you've taken so far? I have $25 on heads. Okay. I, I was gonna. I have. I have a note in here to that talks about that because it, it's have, plus. They're both plus a hundred, aren't they? At least they were yesterday 100. when I looked. They were plus. Gotta, both were plus a hundred when I was looking uh, on DraftKings. Um, the next one I have of is I have twenty five dollars on CMC to win, uh, Super Bowl MVP at plus four forty to win one hundred and ten dollars. Okay. And then these are some long shots that I have so far. Each team to score one plus touchdown and one plus field goal in each half, ten dollars to win two sixty. That's each all that team, that is, or is yeah. this parlayed? No, this is this is just a straight bet. Oh, I like that. Plus t- ten to win two sixty on that is really good. Next one, each team to score one rushing touchdown and one passing touchdown in each half. $10 to win 1500 That'd be a shootout. Yeah. Next one I placed is Debo Samuel to win MVP at plus 2500 $10 to win 250 Any offensive lineman to score a touchdown, 5 to win 325 That's a good one. The yeah. Chiefs could easily throw it to a tackle. Yeah, and then they could. Andy and Reid is known to randomly mix it up here and there. And then I have a I have a same game parlay with the Chiefs with that you can't parlay it, but it is if Debo wins the Super the Super Bowl MVP, Niners minus two and a half, Debo Samuel to score two plus touchdowns, Debo sixty yards receiving and five receptions and fifty yards rushing. <clears throat> And that's five to win four eighty seven. Okay. Yeah. So are you gonna? I'm assuming you're gonna throw some more down at the end of the day. Probably at some point. I mean, honestly, kind honestly, what I'm thinking about when I'm when I'm betting on this game, just from the perspective that I think the way the game's gonna go, is there's a very good chance that this is an extremely low scoring battle. But I think that I think that the Niners run game is very, is a significant thing in this football game where you watched what the Ravens did in that matchup against the chiefs and the AFC championship, where they are like one of the best running football teams in the league. And they completely abandoned the run. And it was like the the, the Niners are not going to be that quick to abandon the run. And they're going to stick. They're definitely going to stick with it. That's pretty much what got them here. Is having is getting the ball to CMC as much as possible. Exactly. And even if they're not getting the ball to CMC, they also have guys that they're going to manufacture touches for, like Debo Samuel. Like I'd be shocked if Debo Samuel wasn't a key factor in this game. He always is in these big moments. He always balls when they play in the NFC championship or in the Super Bowl. He's always had big games. I like Debo as a big game player, and I think that he probably he wants the ball in these situations. And I think that he shows up in this situation against the chiefs. 
So that's why I yeah. threw a flyer on him for Super Bowl MVP because you can probably sit here. I mean, Brock Purdy at plus 200 is cool, whatever. But like if I'm, I'm looking for like long shots at this point, I'm not going to bet on Patrick Mahomes or Brock Purdy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think <clears> that <throat> the, the next two biggest, um, the next two best odds for that is probably CMC and Travis Kelsey. If I'm mistaken, Travis Kelsey's 12 to one. Really? Is it Pacheco? I th- uh, let me take a look here. <clears throat> Probably. So, so I'm looking at some of these right now. So I'm on I'm on DraftKings, and they have a it's, whole section. Go ahead. It's Mahomes is plus one forty. Not a bad bet. <clears throat> Brock Purdy's plus two hundred. Christian McCaffrey's plus four forty. Then Travis Kelsey's at 17, 1700. Hmm. Pacheco's at th- plus 3,000. Jeez. I'm surprised. All right. So I'm on DraftKings. You, you use FanDuel. For whatever reason, I can't win any money on FanDuel. Um, but on DraftKings, they have an entire section that is labeled for the Swifties and it's all Taylor Swift related bets. Um, But before I get into that, what DraftKings has been doing is every day they are like offering a bet that's boosted odds. So I have already, they boosted CMC 30 plus rush yards in each half from minus 140 to plus 120. That was one of the bets from, um, earlier in the week today's super boost is um pacheco and Ayuk both to have 50 yards from scrimmage for the whole game so that's <laughs> that's from um, minus know, yeah, 140 to, to plus 110 <clears throat> okay okay um i i didn't have any of the other ones because I, I didn't bet any of them, but that's what I've got so far. I, was only, I only have the CMC one, but back to the Taylor Swift portion of the bets. So there's five that I wrote down here that I thought were pretty interesting. This one's first one's called Friendship Bracelets, and it's Kelsey or use check to score the first touchdown, boosted to plus 600. Um, I knew you were trouble. CMC to have 150... Um, plus rushing and receiving yards boosted to 150. Look what you made me do. Chiefs to trail in the fourth quarter and win the game at plus 500. 15, Mahomes 15 plus rush yards and 215 pass yards, minus 140. And then mine, it it's called mine, and then it says Travis Kelsey 87 plus receiving yards boosted to 190. So there's some in there that I like. I like the Travis Kelsey one. I'm going to probably bet on this um, Chiefs to trail in the fourth and win the game, throw a couple dollars on that, and then probably CMC, 150 rush and receiving yards. Um, those are just a few that I like. I'm I'm probably going to end up slamming a couple other Kelsey bets. There's one for him to have um, 30 yards in the first quarter at minus 110, which I kind of like. Um, you really like Kelsey against Fred Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw? I do, because I don't know what else the Chiefs are going to do as far as getting the ball out. I think they're going to stick to their best weapon. I don't like understand. Dre Greenlaw you... might try to break his neck hitting Travis Kelsey on Sunday. Oh, no doubt. There's no a doubt. good chance that that happens. I, I completely agree with you. Um, I think the Niners are going to just solely focus on trying to get Kelsey el- like out of the out of taken out of the game, not like try to hurt him, but like completely eliminate him from yeah. like a scheme perspective. But I think Andy Reid's too smart to let that happen. So I um, mean, Eric be enemy. Andy Reid is too smart to make that happen. I mean, Eric be enemy. No. Um. But yeah, I, I I think Kelsey I like the Kelsey to score first is is one of my favorite bets. Um 
there was another one in, there's a couple other novelty bets that are on here that I that I liked um or that I don't know if I'm going to end up taking but I just think they're always fun to like think about um let me try and find it I always like the one with the jersey number so like the first person to score a touchdown with a jersey higher than 22 and a half so that literally gives you Clyde Edwards Hilaire let me see here. Let me take a look here. Travis Kelsey, Noah Gray, which I don't really think. What number's Pacheco? Ten. Yeah. And then that'll <laughs> give you that gives you CMC. Not uh Ayuk. Is Ayuk over no, there? He's eleven. Damn, I'm fucked up. <laughs> That's crazy that you don't know anybody's number. I don't know. I'm sorry. I know what everybody looks like, but I can't give you an, I, I can't give you all the numbers. It's usually the complete opposite in football because they're wearing helmets. Usually everybody knows their number, but they don't know what they look like. Yeah. George Kittle. So it's pretty much if you think that Kittle CMC or Kelsey scores first, then you're taking over 22 and a half, which to get that at 110 that's pretty good that's pretty good odds i would say cuz the two guys that probably score the most on those teams are Kelsey and CMC bro i was trying to ruby rose nuke a fucking jerick mckinnon first touchdown score but i don't know if he's not playing or not but if he is playing and that's listed i'm i'm putting like 25 bucks on him to score the first touchdown um it says he returned to practice two days ago. Listen, he, for some reason, bro, <clears throat> he's going to score. I'm telling you, it's going to be, it's going to be a weird fucking thing, but he's going to score. Oh, wait, never mind. It says, well, wait, dude, everybody, he's got blonde hair. I don't know. All right. Well, th all these articles are lying to me, so I don't know what to what to trust but and i think Kader i think Kadarius tony is gonna score too <laughs> like did, did you see so no one reason. of the more one of the more alarming things from media day was him saying that he's a number one receiver when he, he gets is. the ball and that's crazy he is that guy can't even line up on sides because they don't feed him because he's not good. L bro, listen, he's going to have like eight catches for 182 yards and two touchdowns on Sunday. If he does that, he's the Super Bowl MVP. I'm, bet I'm betting him to win the Super Bowl MVP right now. His Super he's Bowl MVP line is... He's got to win it, right? Bro, I don't even think he has a line. Because we're too sharp. Oh, plus 50,000. <laughs> Hold on. I'm about to take that. One dollar wins you 501. Like, it's worth Like, that's actually worth it. Like, all jokes aside, like, that is actually worth it. Why not at that point? What if, what if this is his breakout game? Bro, what about Trent McDuffie? Bro, there's defensive play that's crazy that there's that many defensive players ahead of him to win Super Bowl MVP. Bro, ten dollars on Trent McDuffie would win a six grand. Like I feel like we, we could gotta we could him. retire. I just think like it's worth it. Like <clears throat> I don't know, dude. That's all right. Here back to these. So these on here, it has coin toss outcome, heads plus 100, tails plus 100. And then to win the coin toss, Chiefs and Niners are both plus 100. So you got a bad line. Fuck. I'm going to bet Joe Thune to win Super Bowl MVP. There's a bet right here. Go ahead. $250 would win me 187 grand. <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, like we could change our lives. Uh, that would be something hey eh? um there is this who will have there's this cross sports special for nfl and soccer so 
Um, Sunday morning, Manchester United plays Aston Villa. Is that the 11th? Yeah. So Sunday morning, Aston Villa plays Man United, and this bet is who will have more. CMC touchdowns versus Man United goals, and you can get Man United goals at plus 100, a tie at plus 250, or CMC at plus – or tie at 225 or CMC at plus 250. I think I'm going to take Man United goals. Do it. I mean, there's they score three goals. CMC, he scores three touchdowns. I mean, props to him, but – because if he scores three touchdowns, he's going to win, and they win, he's the Super Bowl MVP. <laughs> For sure. I so. I just want I just want anybody other than a than a quarterback to win Super Bowl MVP. That's it. That's yeah. all I want. <clears throat> yeah. Um speaking of quarterbacks, I saw today on Twitter something that um was pretty cool. Um PFF rated or uh graded the quarterbacks or the highest graded quarterbacks in the Super Bowl since two thousand six. Okay. So Number one, Nick Foles, 92.3 versus the Patriots. Jalen Hurts, 92.2 versus the Chiefs. Nice. Russell Wilson, 91.7 versus the Patriots. Aaron Rodgers, 91.6. I don't know who that one was against. Who'd they win their Super Bowl against? Either way. Um, Eli Manning at 91.5. Versus the Patriots and Patrick Mahomes, 89.5. I think that was against the Niners. Never mind. That was against the Eagles. The Super Bowl. Oh, wait. <clears throat> so who did the Packers win their Super Bowl? Their one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers against? The Steelers. So, yeah, that was 91.6. So that's the sixth highest graded quarterback since 2006 in the Super Bowl. Two Eagles. Pretty nifty. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, do you have any anything else on the Super Bowl Super Bowl or how you think it's gonna go? Or, or are you at peace? Um, I do have a moon tweet that I can share. I'm sure. So preliminary lunar analysis cert certainly favors the Chiefs. The day of the Super Bowl is a waxing crescent moon, and the Chiefs are 19-1 and one in the last five years under the waxing crescent conditions. By far the best moon phase. Their only loss came in came October 10th, 2021. So, I, I tried betting against the moon before and lost. And so the moon's undefeated. Yeah, what did Nick, what did Nick text me today? Nick said... Really good news. The favorites in the Super Bowl are four and two since 2000 when the groundhog sees his shadow. I saw that. <laughs> they were just talking about that on it was either part. I think it was pardon my take. They were talking about that. <clears throat> so he didn't see his shadow, though. So. The, it's good for the underdogs. Wow. Not enough people are talking about that, though. I didn't see that at media row at all. Not once. Is I saw a tweet about Brock Purdy being asked if, about um, the guy that killed Kennedy. Is that accurate? Or because I didn't click the video. Yeah, I he guess looks they, just like him. Yeah, I guess they're saying that he looks like him. He had no clue who he was. You could tell he was just like yeah. He, off. I and mean, that's like, an yeah, absurd thing. To, that's a, an insane thing to ask. Yeah, I, the Super Bowl media days are just seems like seemed to be like ridiculous it also looked like kyle shanahan was fucking plastered out of his mind he and was he went out the one night before there was videos or pictures of him i saw not good but whatever i guess but yeah so maybe maybe it's the 49 or maybe it's the chiefs year there also has to be a part <clears throat> of you that like you can only ask so many questions in a two week span to the point where you have to just start bringing up random shit. Yeah. Like there's only so much I feel like you can ask about the game, right? Yeah. It's just stupid. Did you see the reporter that asked Patrick Mahomes about his dad's DUI? 
No, I didn't that's, see that one. That's just flat. This like I, I'm if I'm in like the firm camp of like if you ask a question like that, you should like low key lose your job. I mean, there's just no need to ask that. I understand like having fun with it and and asking silly questions, but. Like if they asked Brock Purdy if he like knew who Anna Fry was, be- you know that I'm talking about like that massive meme where he like looks like that random girl. Yeah, it looks like that. Yes. Yeah, where if he's like, D- like his brother videotaped him after the game and like said he looked like her. Like if the media asked about that, like that's just like funny and like clowning him, and he thinks it's funny clearly. But like asking somebody's dad who's on like their sixth <laughs> DUI, like. That's just like not cool. So too, like too far, too far. Yeah, like a little too far. But so I mean, so to be to be fair, I think that that would have happened to like say the Texans made it to the Super Bowl. There's no doubt somebody's asking C.J. Stroud about his dad being in jail for sexual assault. But that's why I th- like literally. I think that at a point, like you should probably got to draw the like, line. It, it's like it's not even disconnecting the art from the artist because they're not even involved. Like CJ Shroud's not involved in that situation. Not at Patrick all. Mahomes Mahomes is has nothing to do with his that. dad. Yeah. Like slugging a bunch of rum and cokes and then driving. Yeah. Like that's his dad's decision. So I just think that those questions, I, I think those are those questions where like the reporters think that they're like way cooler than what they actually are. They are nerds and like, are finally like, Oh, like I get to, I, I get to like look make Patrick Mahomes like look stupid, which is like, why would you do that? You get like, that's their uh, I'm going to go viral moment in their head when you're asking that question. It's sad. So you just look like an idiot. So with that being said, do you have anything else on the Super Bowl or are you at peace? No, I think I'm good. I'm really excited to watch this one. We get a rematch from what? Twenty. Twenty one. I don't know. Probably. I think that's when they last played. Um, oh, question for you. Who do you think has the most to prove in the Super Bowl? Do you think it's Shanahan? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, probably. Okay. That's that's where I'm at too. Just want to But I don't think it's like I don't think that's like that bit like hot of a take. Like, like no, really, I don't like... think so either. I don't think there's any like real like this Super Bowl. There's like no real hot takes like both of these teams are expected to be in the Super Bowl every single year. Essentially, like both of these coaches are held to like an extremely high regard. At some point, Mm -hmm. you probably want to see Shanahan win a Super Bowl. With that being said, Shanahan, if he loses, Shanahan's still one of the best coaches in the NFL. So like it's, it's one of those situations where it's like, you definitely want to see him win a big game, like win a bring a Super Bowl home. And I'm sure he's dying for one. But like, even if the Niners were like, we need to change something up and get rid of him, wherever he goes next as a head coach, he'll be one of the best in the league still. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're the Niners and they don't win, like you don't win, moving on from him is easily would be one of the dumbest decisions they could make. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm right. I'm right there with you. I I have the uh, the box score pulled up from the last time the Niners and the Chiefs played. It was 2020, um, mm-hmm. and the Chiefs obviously won. It was 31-20. But I'm looking at this quarter breakdown, and going into the fourth quarter, the uh, Niners were winning 20 to 10, and the Chiefs hung 21 unanswered on them. I I will win. never forget that. Which is cr- just crazy. I completely forgot that it was uh, like they came back that heavy. That was the Raheem Mostert and Damian Williams show. And Playoff both Damian. Of them, yeah, the, the, both the running backs absolutely went nuclear in that matchup. They played their hearts out. Yeah, I'm trying to get the... Uh, see if I can get this. Yeah, Damian Williams, 17 carries for 104 yards and a touchdown. Raheem Mostert, 12 for 58 and a touchdown. And then Tyreek Hill had nine for 105. Sammy Watkins, maybe, five for 98. Yeah. What a name. Yeah, and I remember, I forget who it was. I I think it might have been Cowherd or something. Everybody loves to bring up the Brady 
situation where it's like Brady said, like for the first few Super Bowls, he gets too juiced up and spent all of his energy and it's a long halftime, like blah, blah, blah. I think Bill was saying this actually. Yeah. And he was like, Brock Purdy's just like, hasn't been in a situation like this. It's like, correct. But with that being said, like they have guys on both teams, on both sides of the football who have played deep, deep playoff football, who have played in the Super Bowl already, have lost, have won on both sides. These teams have more than enough veteran leadership to be able to guide a team through this situation. It's not like Brock Purdy came out of nowhere and he's leading like an underdog team to a, a Super Bowl. Like this team's extremely well prepared. They have one of the be- they have some of the best coaching staff in the league. They have some of the best players at each said position in the league. And if not like top eight, like where like you have the best running back, you have the best left tackle, you have a top 10 quarterback, you have the best uh, linebacker in the league. You have uh, Nick Bosa, a great edge rusher. Those guys all have played in, in the Super Bowl. So mm-hmm. I just think it's one of those situations that it's, it's not precedented because these teams are so good both of them are so good have such great players on it and i think that and the coaching staffs are great and have been here before i think it's going to be like an amazing matchup yeah that's what i was going to say about the coaching staff both of these guys have been there before they know how to operate i'm sure they'll have those guys dialed in for i mean the, the halftime show i get it it's long but like that should give you more of a time to if you it could be beneficial if you have a shitty first half it gives you time to reset and it gives you a little bit more time to get things prepared for the second half and make sure that you got all your ducks in a row so that you, you look at and look as bad in look, the first half you look at like the Bengals situation a few years ago where like evan mcpherson like blew it for them they should have won he missed the kick and he was out on the field at the halftime show like watching things like that like yeah. little little things like that where the Bengals have, haven't been there forever and joe burrow was just getting started like everybody was so young like that is a situation where i look at and i'm like well that's a team that just doesn't have it right now and they're new to they're new on the scene and i guarantee you that the next time they make it to the super bowl if they ever do it wouldn't be like that again so i just think that like that there's certain situations where that comparison makes sense but i don't think it fits for for this situation that we have yeah i think there's probably too much experience all over like you said so i do miss joe burrow though i can't wait for him to be healthy yeah all right. Um, that, yeah, that's all that I got, though. All right. Perfect. All right. So obviously the senior bowl just happened. Things are really heating up. Uh, I, I literally said to you the other day, like, because we I said that the college I said college basketball is dead because it is. And um, and you said that I hate college athletics. Nobody has wa- watched more college football than me last year. Nobody. I, I would love to see name one person that has. I watched every si- I sat here with three monitors up four multi-screen on every single monitor and watched every game from noon to three o'clock in the morning when Hawaii was playing and bet on every single game. So um, with that being said, I love watching the talent that's going to be coming up through the ranks and in the NFL. So this time of the year is extremely exciting for me and probably my favorite because it's just, like I said, it's just like fun to watch. Um, And The only thing, and I texted this to you, the only thing that I say that I have critique about college football is, one, the transfer portal and stuff sucks dick, and hopefully they get it figured out. But the one thing that I want them to always do is I want the best brands in college football to play the best brands in college football on a week-to-week basis because every college football like has an opportunity to make every game like a damn near spectacle. Like, it could be like some of the biggest sporting events ever. If you were to a good example is like, why is Ohio state and Penn state playing at noon? Like, no, that should be the prime time night slate game, no matter what. So it's just like little things like that, where I think like scheduling issues are a big deal. And I want to see the best teams play each other. Yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you. I think that, that would make things i mean i already i already love college football but i think that that just adds like another element because then you don't get like the 
the random Penn State versus Delaware Delaware game. And then you don't get like the yeah. Alabama Alabama versus Mercer week twelve of the or week nine of the season. Um they should never play each other. Never. Um and I mean the, I understand like the benefit that Mercer gets because they're on a they get to be on a national scale, but like who watches what this good game? Do, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. The stadiums There's, are empty. There's re- you those games are games that if you're an Alabama fan, if you go in, you end up leaving at halftime. Yeah. So I mean, there's that. You went to Penn State. Like when the yeah. when if there was a bad game at noon, the stadium would be half empty. Like yeah, you're not like you're. It's like oh, like they play Villanova this to- week. There's Toledo. They play Toledo. Let's, and let's just take this one we, off. We left at the third quarter. So. There's and just like went to went somewhere else and finished the game because like what what's the purpose of me standing in there for four quarters when they're going to end up winning by 45 points when I could go watch it at a bar or apartment and watch five other games at the same time. So I think that it's it's probably they probably would have to wait a couple years to do it since they make schedules a couple years in advance, but prioritizing those bigger matchups because like realistically we know who the bigger name programs are going to be and those athletic directors and coaches meeting or i don't even know how they do it but getting those other big name teams on the on the schedule would just add another layer to to college football which would be great like the 12 game season already matters a lot but adding that element to it where you really don't have a week off would would be amazing very very entertaining so i think there's that and then um like you mentioned with penn state and ohio state like that game should never be played at noon it's just an it's so annoying from a fan perspective because that's normally the biggest game of the weekend and the biggest games just feel like they hit a little bit harder when they're at that later slate at like seven thirty, eight o'clock on ABC. Like those games are when I was growing up, that game was like, holy shit, this is the best game like of the day. It's going to be played at, it's going to be played at uh eight o'clock at night. You get what, what's his name? Kurt. Um, shit. Common Kirk? commentate. Kirk not Kirk. Kirk, Kirk Street. Street. No, there's a guy, another guy, Kurt Bruce Davis. Uh, it, well, it was Reese Davis and Kurt. Um, fuck, I can't think of his name, but Kurt might not even be the right name. But uh, that always felt like so much more fun watching it, even if I didn't care about the teams per se. It just knowing like, oh, Texas Oklahoma is going to be at eight o'clock tonight. Like, I can't wait to watch that game. Texas but Oklahoma now was noon. another game that was at noon. And it yeah, I was just gonna in, say, but that game was yeah. at noon. But it was a phenomenal game, no doubt. But yeah, it was waiting all day to to stay to stay and watch that. Like, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I forgot about that because we watched that. I remember we watched that like via yeah. like the internet together. That, but like we, that game was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy, and we bet we had a crazy bet. We we won, and like, but still, like you said, like it'd be sick to do it. But with all that being said. There's nothing better than the draft season and getting to see where some of the next great young players are going to land like in the NFL. So me and Noah were texting the other day because obviously the football season is kind of running. It's over pretty much. Um, And we're going to do our first big board 1.0. And we obviously are going to have two different ones. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start off, though, with my first four because I genuinely think that there are four legitimate blue chippers in this draft class. First, I'm going to go with Marvin Harrison Jr. He's the complete total package. He's, he literally has it all. Um, The next one I have at two, Joe Alt. He is as smooth as they come footwork wise, and he's 6'7", 280. Three, 
Caleb Williams. When you watch quarterbacks play in college football, like a lot of what these scouts are looking for are guys who who came into playing college football and immediately made an impact. The very first play Caleb Williams ever had in college football, he came in during the second quarter when they were down against Texas and had a 66-yard touchdown run. Immediately made an impact. That game was crazy. I remember watching that. At that point, it was like, holy shit, this kid's the next big, like the next real deal. And I think that the only thing, the only reason that people are sitting here and there is a slight doubt about what Caleb Williams, who Caleb Williams is and what he could possibly be is strictly because he was in college too long. He, he actually, he actually downgraded because he spent too much time in college football. He would have been the first overall draft pick probably the last three years. Um, He's going to be this year. He is phenomenal. And I think he's a legitimate blue chip uh, quarterback. And then the last guy at four, and then I'll let you give your top four that I have as a blue chipper is Brock Bowers. He's a dog. He's extremely versatile. He's a great pass catcher and he's a great run blocker. And if he goes to the right offense, he'll be amazing. So there's my, my top four. And I, I labeled them as my blue chip prospects in this draft class. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you with my number one for Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, I think he's the complete package, the real deal, probably the best college wide receiver prospect that we've ever seen um, up to this point. So I'm right there with you. Um, At two, I have Caleb Williams. I think he's another guy that is just automatic is going to go in and make an Im- immediate impact um wherever he ends up um i have his stats pulled up from the year that he so what 2022 is when he won the heisman right yes so that season he was was just bonkers so uh 66 percent completion percentage 4537 yards 9.1 uh yards per uh like yards per completion, 42 touchdowns, five picks. Um, and then 2023, 68% complete, 68.6 completion percentage, 3,633 yards, 9.4 uh, yards per completion, 30 touchdowns, five picks. So 12 less touchdowns. But if you take a look at that USC team, the, the year he won the Heisman versus this past season, they had Jordan Addison and Jordan had Jordan Addison won like receiver of the year. Didn't he? Yeah, he won the Bolitnikov. Yeah. So like you lose that big of a weapon, there's going to be a decline. I think the biggest thing, like the, one of the most important things or two, the two most important things about Caleb Williams stats from last year to this year is his interception numbers stayed the same, but his completion percentage went up. So that's two things that are a really, really good sign moving forward to the NFL. And I understand he got critiqued, which he should because he's underneath a spotlight. And that's just the job. That's just what happens when you're the best player, one of the best players in the country. You're going to be put under a microscope. People are going to are going to nitpick. But for you to go out there and loot, I mean, Jordan Addison probably accounted for 12 touchdowns on his own. If I, I, I don't have it pulled up, but it truly wouldn't surprise me. Um, and then they had another good running back. So like they were way more stacked from a skill position standpoint. Um, but same picks, higher completion percentage. That's a great sign. So I've got Caleb Williams at two. Um, I have, three. can I add one more thing about Caleb Williams real quick? You yeah. won't see it like that. He has like legitimate arm strength. Like he, yeah, he does a, a lot. Of, he does a lot of stuff out of structure, which scares a lot of people. And that's why he gets the Mahomes comparison, like throughout this process that you're going to hear, like he's the closest prospect to that we've ever had to Mahomes. And they genuinely do mean that because a lot of the things that he gets away with, like, you're like, how the fuck do you get away with that? And he does because he's Caleb Williams. Now you have to see if that translates at the NFL level, but I don't think that I don't think that there should be an issue if he's put in the correct position with the right coaching that he's not going to make an immediate impact, but go ahead for your third. Yeah. So my third, 
Uh, there is some slight bias to this, but I have Olu Fashanu at three. I mean, I watched him all season, and as brutal as this Penn State offense was, he was somebody that you were 100% able to rely on as far as protecting the quarterback and being a dominant um, player in the run game. So I, I, and he's a Penn Stater. So like, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I don't think the margin between him and Joe Walt is obviously that big. I mean, I think they're both going to be immediate starters, immediate impact guys. And if they both stay healthy, have successful NFL careers. Um, I also want to say that this was really tough because these first one, two, three, four, five, one, two, these first five guys that I have, the margin for um, the the difference margin in in talent for these five guys is so slim that I had a hard time picking this order. So my number four, I had Brock Bowers. I mean, I love him as a tight end prospect, um, probably more than Kyle Pitts. And I, I just really like, the, obviously the only thing for concern was his injury this year, but the fact that he came back and still played and was still good, like I'm, I'm really not too worried about it. Um, do you want me to go to five, or did you only give your top four? <clears throat> I gave my top four. I'll go five. Five, I have I have Drake May. I think this is one of those situations where there's going to be... He is somebody else who... you. This happens in, in the NFL draft where people just like start overthinking and talking and so much shit's going on. And a report that just came out was like, NFL scouts think that Drake May is going to be this year's quarterback that drastically slips in the draft. I don't think that that happens at all. He's 6'4", 230. He's built like arm. an NFL quarterback. Yeah, he's he's got a strong arm, and he actually played the pro-style offense at North Carolina. He didn't have as great as a year that you wanted him to have, but like I said before, he's a younger guy. He showed great flashes when he was younger in his career and is really good, and then you look at his size and how he can throw the football, and I don't understand how teams aren't like, if you can't get Caleb Williams, Drake May is probably the best consolation prize that you could ever probably get in an, a, as an NFL draft, like in an NFL draft. Yeah, I have his uh, 22 versus 23 stats pulled up here. And 22 had a crazy season. Um, 66% completion percentage, 4,300 yards, 38 touchdowns, 7 picks. Um if I do be remember correctly, they probably had three or four skill players get drafted last year. <clears throat> um, and I can't, I'm not too familiar with the skill position players that they had this year, but 2023, he was at 63%, 3,600 yards, 24 picks, nine touchdowns. So like, I, they had Tez Walker, but it's already it's like, not the same. People really, people really liked him. As like a an NFL, and I've even seen some people take him in like a mock in the first. I think Tez is going to be one of those guys that fall. Like I don't see it with him. He had a really bad Senior Bowl, but yeah, that that was like his key weapon this past year. But go ahead. I, and I'm not discrediting him this, and I don't think it's necessarily something for him to worry about. I mean, two interceptions, not that like not that big of a deal. Now, if it went from like seven to twelve, then I would probably be a little bit more concerned. But, I mean, I think he's still going to be a phenomenal quarterback and somebody who, if you aren't getting Caleb Williams and you end up getting Drake May, like, you're not going to be upset with that. No. So. You want to give your six? So, my, I, I didn't go to five yet, but at oh. five, I did my first four and then you did five. And now oh, I'm my at bad. five. You're good. So, at five, I had Joe Alt. I think okay. these five. These first five guys, Marvin Harrison Jr., Caleb Williams, Olu Shanu, Brock Bowers, and Joe Alt, I think those are five blue chippers. I had a very tough time putting the order between three, four, and five between those guys. I I just I just really like the this first group of five players. I think they're gonna be extremely talented. I think they're gonna be really successful in the NFL. Um 
but yeah, those are my, f I have five blue chippers and it's going to be those five. I think those are all pretty much guaranteed locks. Can't wait for this to come back and bite me, but that's all right. Do you want to give your six? Yeah, it's six. I mean, six, I had Drake May. So nice. right there with you. And it sounds like the same reasonings that we just said at my six, yep. we, I have, I have Fashu. I don't know how to say his name, but like you said, he's extremely, extremely reliable. And yeah, I mean, th that's, that's pretty much it. Like he was a bright spot on a bad Penn state offense. Yeah. You're not going to go wrong with either one of these tackles that we mentioned Olu or Joe Alt. So like at this point, it's just being very particular and, if you're an NFL team, it's whoever's available is you're gonna is who you're gonna end up taking. I think like I I'm not gonna be surprised if Olu goes before Joe Alt, and I wouldn't be surprised if Joe Alt goes before Olu. I think I think they're both gonna be phenomenal tackles for a long time. Um, after on, Drake May, so go ahead. After Drake May, I have Malik Nabbers or Neighbors. Sorry, Malik Neighbors. Uh, wide receiver LSU. I mean, I think he's by far the second best wide receiver. I don't think he's as complete as Marvin Harrison Jr., but I think he might be a better deep threat than Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, I wa after watching film on this guy, it felt like every touchdown that he scored was like 45 yards or further. So I, I think he's a he might be the best deep threat in this draft, but I solidify him as the second best wide receiver. Yeah, I messed up on my list here. You just gave number seven, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. So in my, I, I have Malik neighbors here as well, um, but he will not be in my top 10 for 2.0. Um, I get it. Like, He's everybody like people said, like, I think that he's if you can get him, he's comparable to Marvin Harrison Jr. I, I'm not going to fall for the fast guys. I know he can run routes. Andrew pushed back on this against me, but I I already said, like, I'm not falling for a fast guy ever again at wide receiver, especially like this early. So me personally, I'll eat my words on it if he's like the best receiver and he's a dog. But I'm out. I'm out on Malik neighbors, but I do have him at seven on this. Because I do think I, somebody's I, gonna take him early. I'm not necessarily picking him because he is fast. I think he's a just a very good overall receiver too, and I think the speed and the deep threat helps. Like I think if he didn't have that and he was slightly slower, I still think he would be a good NFL wide receiver, and I still think I would probably have him at two. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna go eight. If that's cool with you. Yep. I have Byron Murphy the second from Texas interior uh, D lineman, which sounds a little weird, but he has an extremely high motor is strong and is very good at rushing the passer. And I think that that's really rare that you see from an interior lineman throughout like these processes, like over the years, like the guys who can pressure the quarterback from the middle it's extremely obvious like and i'm going to say some of the best names in the in the league and i'm not comparing him to him to them because that's unfair but you think of guys like Aaron Donald and you think guys of like Chris Jones who can pressure the quarterback from that interior position and how much of a difference they can make and i think that this guy could be special and you take a shot at him and i think that he could be a game record for you i agree with you i think he was like the anchor of that Texas defensive line. Um, I didn't have him in my top 10, but I had him in an honorable mention. Nice. Cause I think he's a, he's going to be a beast. Um, my next guy, I had Terry on Arnold cornerback from Alabama. Um, I really like this guy. I know that everybody's been really high on um, um, the kid from Toledo, Quinion Mitchell. Um, I think Quinion Mitchell's really good. I have him in my honorable mention. But what I saw from Terry on Arnold on film was he's just very sticky. He sticks to these wide receivers. And from what I saw, he 
it felt like he was in the back pocket of receivers at all times. And yeah, I said, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. But no, I, I, I just think he, I think, I think he's what the same size as, as Mitchell, but I, I don't. Mitchell's six foot. Yeah. I think Terry on Arnold's like six foot, like one ninety five. But he's but he's long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it also that it might there might be some Alabama like defensive bias built into this, but just from what I saw, he was making plays on one on one matchups, making plays on jump balls, and he just felt like a guy that was with wide receivers at all times whenever I was seeing him on film. Definitely. And he and he was doing it at the highest level. So that's that plays into it too. Perfect. Perfect that you just said that. And I'm going to literally base what you just said off of my number nine. And I have Quinny on Mitchell. Um Toledo, ball hawk, physical, can make tackles. Um, he's a complete animal. And he did it at Toledo. And that's kind of the question. Like, okay, like he played at a school like Toledo. But you went to the Senior Bowl against the best talent in college football, and you absolutely were – you popped out in front of every single person that was there. He was the biggest talk of the town at the Senior Bowl. So to be able to have the film that shows that you're able to do that and then immediately go to a spot where you're like, okay, let me go prove it, go and prove it. In my head, that guy's a dog. He's one of my favorite. He's an immediate one of my favorite players in this year's draft class. And I, I hope that he goes early and I love that guy. Yeah. There's a lot of good corners or a lot. Yeah. A lot of good corners in this draft. I want to say there's what, like five or six potential first round corners. It feels very first round yeah. corner. He- like there's not going to be five or six drafted, but it in the first round, but it feels like there are five or six guys that could be drafted in the first round. I agree. <laughs> You want to give me um, number nine? Yeah, number nine. I had Dallas Turner, Edge from Alabama. Mm. Um, I think the film speaks for itself for this guy. He's probably the best edge rusher in the in the draft. Um, a little bit, probably a little smaller than some of like the more prolific edge rushers in the NFL. But like, he's still gonna get the job done, and he's just a freak show. So like, I I think if you need if you need an edge, I think you're taking him. Yeah, I wish that I put him in my top 10 instead of Malik Neighbors, but you, you live and you learn. Maybe next time. Um, Do you want me to give my number 10? Yeah, and then I'll give you mine. My number 10, I have Roma Dunze. Um, he is 6'3", 216, big as hell, great hands, great hey, at yo. contested catches, um, and he's he's already ready for the pros. He's He's really good. He could run every route. Um, something that something that I really like is a guy who's able to make those contested catches. And I think that it's not a situation where he wasn't able to get separation because I think that that could probably be something that you could push back on. It's like, well, is he getting separation on those routes? And it's like he is, but where Penix was throwing him the ball and how they used him, he was able to come down with those highly contested catches almost every single time. So I do, I, I like Roma Dunze over Malik neighbors in this situation, but I didn't have it like that, but yeah, that's my number 10. Yeah. I I like him a lot too. I remember, um, I also think just like being in that, like that Washington offense and getting a lot of targets, just helps your case, especially if you're able to play at a high level and, and um, like catch the football. So like he clearly can be a high volume receiver and I think, you know what you're getting with him. I think he's going to be really good too, but I, I did not have him in my top 10. Okay. There's a lot of receivers too. My, my last guy here is Jerzon Newton D tackle from Illinois. Um, I thought so watching this kid play against Penn State, it felt like he made every single tackle in that game. It it was almost like I felt like I was watching. Obviously, Aaron Donald is a different species, but like it felt like I was watching a defensive ta- like a defensive tackle, Aaron Donald type, just completely take over a game. 
And that's not something that you really see unless you're at one of those high level guys. And for him to be able to do that from the defensive tackle position, um, I think it's really special. So I, I'm, I really like him a lot. Again, there's probably a little bit of bias because I saw him just dominate against Penn State, but I really like him. I think he's probably, I think him and the kid from Texas that you named are probably the two best interior defensive linemen in this draft. Yeah, no, I I, I like that, and it's like uh, you don't hear a lot of people talking about him. I feel like so I like the deep cut there and the comparison of or not even the comparison, the example that you watched him when he played Penn State and he was a game wrecker. So I, I love that. That's a good that's a good one. I, I want to say this too. I think it I understand that having good edge pressure is important in the NFL, but I think we're getting to the point where if you have really good pass rushing interior defensive linemen, it just takes your defense to an entirely different level. Cause say you have a guy like this and he can be an absolute threat rushing from the interior, but you could also maybe line him up on the outside. That just opens up so many more things for you to do as a defensive coordinator. Oh, and he's good in the run. Like that's super important. And I think that as we start to see the game develop, I think we're going to start to see maybe a little bit more conscious thought go into, hey, if we can get these multi-talented defensive tackles that can rush the passer, pa rush, the, rush the passer, rush the passer, but can also be stout on def on the on the run game, like that's going to make us just a completely different defense. I agree. Like I, I definitely agree. I'm, I'm just trying to think of as the game develops. Like, obviously Jordan, D like, like one of the guys that comes to my mind was like Vince Wolfork was like the very first like huge defensive like nose tackle. Like we obviously don't have that in the NFL anymore. Like those guys that are lining up directly over the center consistently, but he was he, phenomenal. But he wasn't really rushing the passer crazy. But and then to the Eagles now, like they have Jordan Davis and he's not rushing the passer crazy. But then you got Jalen Carter over there who's good at rushing the passer and good at run at stopping the run. Like, I think that that's a very, very important skill set to have if you're going to be a D tackle, not just one dimensional. So I think that's something just to keep an eye out for. Yeah, I agree. All right. I have two. Uh, honorable match mentions. The first one I have Liatu Latu. I love him. I think that he's yeah. probably the best um, edge rusher in this draft, but he medically retired from the game of football because of his neck. And that's, that's probably a red flag. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I mean, I just can't like, I, if, if you are, if you have to medically retire because, and of, of all things like your neck, um, you kind of saw Chris Carson have an issue like this, like where he was a really great player, really great running back, and like literally had to retire in the prime of this career because of a neck injury. Um, I really yeah, it feels like the, neck, neck, shoulder, and knee as like a defensive lineman are like probably the most important things. Yeah, so I really like him, but obviously the medical uh, retiring and getting back to playing with UCLA and their great medical staff obviously was a was a good thing for him. But we'll see how that pans out during the draft process. Dude, That's my if, first. Go ahead. if he he because he I remember watching him against Colorado with you guys, and he was oh another God. guy that was lining up at defensive tackle and was just being or. Maybe not even like he wasn't even like down in a stance. Like he was standing up, rushing center and like centers and guards. And it was just like obviously the Colorado offensive line was so bad, but so bad. It was crazy. He was getting there as if there was nobody there. So I, I, I still think about that game. It was so annoying. It's, it's crazy. But he's also hit, definitely uh, medically retired for a neck injury. Um, is a red flag him being 24 too like is this as good as he's gonna get or can he get better i don't know that's one thing that i always like struggle with is because i think like you can get better but i don't know um but yeah i did like him i had 
I still hear I uh Keon Mitchell as a as a honorable mention, but my first honorable mention is gonna be uh Keon Coleman. I think this guy is probably my favorite wide receiver in the draft class. Um there was a point where I was ready to make a take about him being better than Marvin Harrison Jr. Um I never officially came out and made that statement, but I still think he's really good. He did have his moments where he would like fade in and out of games, but looking back on his stats, like he had some of his biggest games against like two of the biggest teams that they played Clemson and LSU. So like, I think that's a good sign. Um, he's also just a freak show. He's like six, four can jump out of the gym and just like a big body, go get it type of receiver. But he also is pretty good route runner. So I really like him. Um, that's, I mean, I can tackle on that. That's my, that's mine too. That's my next honorable mention. I should have put him in my top 10 and didn't because I feel the same way as you. He's 6'4", yeah. 215. He returned punts for Florida State. He's an absolute freak show. The only thing that he really needs is he needs to get into a situation where he has really good coaching to refine some of his skills. If he's if he's able to refine some of those skills and like you say, stay locked, which I think at the next game at the next level you can. I think um I think it was uh fuck i forget his name he's a writer for the ringer he he gave an example of florida state where the game plan going into it was like okay this would be i forget their names but they had a really talented running back and they also had a really another really talented uh, wide receiver and johnny wilson was the other guy yeah johnny wilson and if it was like a johnny wilson game or the running backs game that he would kind of fade out and check out but you could tell when it was their turn to kind of take over that offense. And that could be strictly just a, a coaching issue uh, uh, at that point or whatever. So we'll see him at the next level, but he's probably one of my favorite players in this draft. He's, he's a dog. Yeah. I, I, I remember watching that Clemson game and he was just, they were just lobbing it up to him and he was just going on everyone's head top. It was so sick. That's like, the, the dream as a wide receiver is just, hey, we're going to just throw you the football in the end zone. You just go up and get it and embarrass somebody. So, yeah, he's he was sick. Um, Florida State also, like, kind of beat the shit out of everybody besides, like, three games. So I can kind of understand, like, checking out because you probably just end up running the football and and or taking out your stars, like, in the second half. So I kind of get that, but um, yeah. Um, I don't really know if I have this guy honorable mention, but it's somebody that I wanted to talk about. I don't even know how to say his last name, but it's Cooper is Cooper DeGene, the kid from Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. So I want, I watched film on this kid. And the first thing that I will say is that it seems like he's probably the best tackler at the corner position in this draft. Um, but something that worried me was I didn't see a ton of film of him like on an island guarding wide receivers and making a lot of plays that way, which is which was something that concerned me because when you get to the next level, you're going to have to be able to do it all and you're going to have to go up against the Justin Jefferson's you're going to have to be you're going to have to go up against Jamar Chase and you're going to have to be able to hold your own so like I don't know if I just didn't watch enough film on him or what but from what I saw I didn't see a ton of that Um, another thing was like it seemed as if the love that that he was getting as a corner was almost boosted by his ability to return punts at a pretty high level which is kind of weird um, because it should just strictly be about him as a corner. If that's how you're going to evaluate him. Um, With that being said, the kid's a good punt returner, which is important. Um, And it definitely adds another layer to his game and definitely boosts his draft stock. But I'm just not sure if I'm there yet on him as like this high up ranked corner. I don't don't know know if you've got a chance. I don't know what being good and this isn't a shot at what you said, because I completely agree with you. I think he's a glorified punt returner. Like I don't see where being good at returning punts equates to being a first round pick. Um, Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. 
like there's guys who you can get i think of like like a lot of dudes you can get undrafted free agents who can do that for you so i'm not seeing how he could be a first round pick at least in my eyes um I don't know. I I don't see him being, I think he falls out of the first round. I think that people just like the idea of a white corner being able to get drafted in the first round. So that's why it's being so heavily talked about at this time. But I think when the cards play out, I I don't see how he goes in the first. Yeah. I think we're going to have to see how he tests at the combine too. I think some of that stuff is going to play into it. I think he's like, test out of his mind. Like think of like, that's what what I was going to say. I think like, I was going to say, I think he'll end up testing really well, which is going to help boost his draft stock. But like, I don't know if I just need to watch more film or what, because I, 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 he's good. Don't get me wrong. But like, I wasn't watching him cover these receivers and like, holy shit, this kid's a lockdown. This kid's the best corner in the class. Yeah. I just didn't get that feeling, but I could go back to the drawing board and be wrong. But after this first first round that's kind of where i'm at no i'm completely with you and um i i have a bet bet right down right now that um i really would like to cash i tailed gillies one boy who's been like smacking nba plays and (laughs) you know who i'm talking about ray yeah he's been like absolutely smacking nba plays and he gave me one and it's $5 $5 to win 712 and the cash outs at at 40 bucks right now. What? Yeah, it's it's yeah, like bro, like it looks really What is good it? Right now. It's the under in the Wizards Cavs game, Evan Mobley to score 20, Donovan Mitchell to score 30 and Kyle Kuzma to score 30. 5 to win 712 bucks. All right, let me see. Kyle Kuzma has 22, Donovan Mitchell has 19, and Evan Mobley has 15. Yeah, holy shit. And you said you had the under? Yeah. What was that number at? 227 and a half. Jeez. Well, shit, yeah. Something something to think about. Uh, That's why I'm looking. I keep looking at this, and I'm like, is this actually like this is starting to look really good, but trying not to get too excited about it obviously but sorry my mind's out of it but with that being said um hopefully everybody enjoys this kind of stuff we're obviously going to be making a little bit of a transition and we're going to be figuring out what we're going to be talking about on a week-to-week basis just because this is the first off season we've ever done obviously so just just getting our our bearings and figuring out what we're going to talk about i think that it's going to be kind of a work in process at least for over the next month but uh, it's definitely going to be heavily, um, not heavily, but we're going to definitely be talking about like the draft and the process and the process that's going into this. And uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. So I do have two other tweets that I bookmarked that I kind of just wanted to talk about a little bit. Let's hear. Um, it. So I think it's interesting that um, one. I didn't even realize that Eric Bieniemy was out of the commander's job until like they officially signed Cliff Kingsbury. So that's a just a complete bonehead move on my part. I just yeah, I don't, I think don't they know ever, why like officially. Know I I did I didn't think they like officially announced that he was out, but I I obviously understand the concept of a new head coach normally means that an entire new staff. Yeah. I just never saw anything official. Um, so. Cliff Kingsbury being in there. Cliff Kingsbury did meet with the Bears too, and and the Raiders. He was supposed to be the Raiders OC, but um, landed at the Commanders. Um, I saw this tweet today, and I think that it seems pretty much that like all the signs are pointing to the Commanders potentially making a move to getting either Caleb Williams or Justin Fields is kind of what it sounds like. Like I think obviously their first pick is going to be would prefer to be Caleb Williams but if they can't I think they probably end up trying to get Justin Fields um but this tweet says a situation developing that says if the commanders cannot bump the bears off Caleb Williams 
Washington may just take Marvin Harrison Jr. at two and trade their second round pick number 36 to the Bears for Justin Fields. <clears throat> but where where I saw that too, I, I think that's a complete bullshit report. And you think I, where if you're if you're the commanders, where does that in in your team building pyramid or whatever you want to call it? How does it make any sense? Like you don't need wide receivers. You just you take a wide receiver in the first round every single year. It's the same. It's like when when the Giants, it, the Gi they have the Giants taking Malik Neighbors. It's like, are you guys going to take a wide receiver every in the first round every single year and miss on the wide receiver every single year? And the commanders don't need wide receiver help. They have really good wide receivers and good weapons. So I just think that like I get the pedigree play and getting like a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., but they need so much on this roster. They gave up a million sacks last year. They yeah. traded away their entire front line on defense. Like they have a lot and they and on top of that, they need a fucking quarterback. Like, like that's just yeah. so. So let's just say priority number one, they need a quarterback. Priority number yeah. two, they need O line. Priority number three, they need ed edge rusher and interior help on the D line. And we could just say I, all defense. And I think all defense. And then, like, I think wide receiver need is like at the absolute bottom. So I just think that that report is absolute bullshit. So I think the the validity validity of it comes from if they are unable to trade with the bears and get K and get K to get that Caleb Williams number one pick. I do think there's probably some validity to them trading for Justin Fields, but I think the reasoning for them taking Marvin Harrison is just like best player in the draft. I don't think there's a defensive player that you can take at number two where you're like, yeah, we're getting the why, most value out of why it. Wouldn't I, you I was going to hold on, hold on, hold on, okay, hold on, sorry, hold on. Sorry. I was going to say, a better fit would be taking one of those offensive tackles in Olu or Joe Alt at number two. Um, but at the same time, like you have, you see a generation, a potentially generational wide receiver sitting there on the board, best player available. At That's two? a tough thing to pass. At two. Yeah. Bro. We just, we, we just had, we just said Marvin Williams is the best player in this draft. I'm but saying you know, that's tough to pass why, up. Why don't you call I'm the saying, Patriots? I'm, I'm saying why don't you call the I'm Patriots? Is the reason I think what the reasoning is behind it is behind but some why, of this. But you just sat here and said I think Keon Coleman could be just as good as Marvin Harrison Jr. There's I'm people not saying that think that Malik personally. Neighbors. I know, I know. Listen, listen. I, and and people who say Malik Neighbors is a, is a equal consolation prize. Like the wide receiver class is deep. There are a billion great wide receivers in the NFL. If you're the commanders and you don't want to take a quarterback at two, if you don't want what Drake may call the call the call the the Raiders right now, call the Giants yeah, right I, now, call the I, Patriots I, right now, call call the fifteen fucking teams that need quarterbacks right now. If you're dumb enough to pass up on Drake May, then let another team get get assets for it at least. Don't take if you take if they take Marvin Harrison Jr. at two with all of the team needs that they have. Who'd they hire at coach Dan Quinn? He'll he'll yes. be fired. He'll be fired in two years. I agree with you. I would if I were them, I would take or trade out. I think my priority, I think I would try to I don't I would have to see what those trade packages look like first, but like I wouldn't if I had to lock in a pick at two, you got one second left, give us your card. I would probably end up taking an lineman because they need that more. I'm just saying these NFL teams, there are moments when they pick with or they want the shiny new toy rather than what's necessarily best for them. Well, that'd be fucking stupid. But, but we've seen that happen why, before. But that's also why I'm going back and, and, and saying that that report in my head has zero validity. Like, I just and don't think fair. it makes a ton of sense. But what was that's the other tweet that you had bookmarked? To totally fair. Um Where's the other one? Uh, actually, that was the only one like really worth mentioning. I don't know why I bookmarked this this other one. It's kind of Super Bowl. Uh, it's Super Bowl like related. Actually, I can read it off. In the last thirty years, every time the Super Bowl has been played between the two teams, 
One team traveling east, one team traveling west. The team traveling west has won. So the Chiefs <laughs> is what it's pointing at. Is that really is that really them traveling west because they're Midwest? Does that count? Yeah. I mean they're going west to Vegas. It's fair. The 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 Niners have to go east to Vegas. How far away? How f- I think it's like an hour flight to Vegas from Kansas City. Kansas City to Vegas flight. Flighty. Um Nonstop, it's three hours on Spirit. I think that they're probably <laughs> flying a little better than Spirit, but yeah, I agree with you like completely. I mean, it's, that's a that's a quick that's a quick flight. That's a quick. Flight. No, no, it is three hours. It's Southwest is three hours. <laughs> okay, why are you saying Southwest? Like the flight? Yeah, the plane. But, yeah, but they're flying private. Like I know, but I'm just like all flight. of these are all these nonstop flights are three hours is my point no definitely all right i know who they're flying with i need eight points from donovan mitchell five from mobley and two from kyle kuzma all right i gotta get off dude i gotta watch this i gotta piss <laughs> okay. i gotta watch I know, this I, game and we'll I bet on the, uh, have this the warriors i bet on the Warriors sixers over so well steph curry has zero threes all right i gotta piss would you have anything else all to right. say go birds <laughs>